Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome. This is the third webinar in Delaware Riverkeeper Network summer series of Zoom forums on the proposed Gibbstown LNG export terminal. The terminal is being challenged in court and the dock that would export LNG uh, from Gibbstown has not yet been constructed. Our goal, uh, our coalition of organizations opposing the export terminal is to never see it get built and to stop any export of dirty frack gas LNG from the Delaware River watershed. We believe that to accomplish this goal, it is absolutely essential that we expose this project for what it is. And that is that it is a, a project that wants to make money off of our natural resources, despite the impacts that we have to pay. And in order to expose this project for what it really is, we must examine the entire supply chain from the frac shale fields uh, in, of Pennsylvania and the LNG liquefaction plant that they want to build in Wyalusing um, and you know, across the 200 miles of um, watershed in Pennsylvania and New Jersey communities that they want to carry the LNG by truck and by rail um, down to Gibbstown, New Jersey, on the Delaware River, and then overseas. Two, import terminals that New Fortress Energy wants to build in Puerto Rico, which we're going to focus on here tonight, Ireland, Jamaica, Nicaragua, Mexico, Angola. So tonight, we're honored to be joined by very special guests, and they're going to be telling us about the Puerto Rican experience with New Fortress Energy and liquefied natural gas and their struggle there. I'm going to introduce each of them now so we can smoothly make um, the presentation, uh, each of them um, for you as we, uh, as we go through um, the webinar tonight. And that way I think you'll be able to pretty clearly see the connection between Gibbstown, New Jersey and San Juan, Puerto Rico. So quickly, I'm going to give a little bit of background on each person. Uh, Ruth Santiago, uh, she is a resident of Salinas in southeastern Puerto Rico, where she has worked with community and environmental groups, fishers associations, and other organizations for over 30 years on projects. And they range from uh, community newspapers, children's services, community school, ecotourism projects, um, to a rooftop solar energy uh, pilot project. And Ruth is active in a really broad range of environmental issues. And she's part of a civil society initiative in Puerto Rico to promote solar communities and energy democracy. And she works through We Want Sun and other organizations to do that. Most recently, she's been working on cases related to energy projects. And that's why she's going to be talking about the New Fortress Energy Plan for an import uh, terminal for LNG in San Juan. Uh, our other speaker from Puerto Rico we're honored to have is Adriana Gonzalez, and she's a geographer and an environmental interpreter from San Juan, Puerto Rico, and she currently works as an environmental justice organizer with the Sierra Club. Her work includes campaigns to promote zero waste, community-based clean energy solutions, advocating clean energy and environmental policy to protect the Northeast Ecological Corridor. She's an activist working with the UN and in negotiations around the world with many nations. In Puerto Rico, she is working for renewable energy and for sustainable development. And our third speaker is more homegrown, that's Jeff Tittle. And he said, has served as the director of the New Jersey chapter of the Sierra Club for over 22 years. He's been involved in every major environmental legislation passed in New Jersey for close to two decades. Most of you know him, but I'm still gonna tell you a little more about him. Some of his legislative and regulatory lobbying achievements include passing of the California Car Law, the uh, Clean Car Law, the Highlands Act, New Jersey's Global Warming Response Act, New Jersey's Fertilizer Law, um, the uh, elect Electronic Waste Recycling Law. Uh, Jeff has helped write and design New Jersey's cat Category 1 surface water quality regulations 
He's worked on teams for Governor McGreevy and Governor Corzine, and he served on key environmental task forces. Named by the Star Ledger as one of the most influential people in New Jersey, he has fought for New Jersey's environment by using his influence to save it. And thank you, Jeff, for being here tonight. So thank you for joining us. Thank you, Adriana, for joining us. And thank you, Jeff, for joining us. So before we start logistics, I'd like to explain. Please put your questions, as you think of them, into the Q&A box. Um, that way, I'll be able to um, download those questions, and we will address those questions after all the presentations are done. Um, we're going to be first hearing from Jeff, who's going to give an overview of the Puerto Rico and Gibbstown story and New Fortress Energy's scheme. Um, second, we're going to hear from Ruth, and she's going to discuss what is occurring now in Puerto Rico and the LNG's uh, industries. Um, uh, to attempt to push um, and export frack gas. And then Jeff is going to show what's happening in Puerto Rico in terms of how it ties in with New Jersey, that connection we're talking about. Then Adriana will discuss the viable and sustainable alternatives she and her partners are working on for energy in Puerto Rico. Groups such as Sierra Club and We Want Sun who want clean, renewable energy and use those sources instead of dirty fossil fuels. And she's going to help us understand how that can be done in Puerto Rico. So at this time, I'd like to just um, go on to the next slide in order to give you just a little bit of orientation. So at the top is Gibbstown, and it's on the Delaware River. If you were to travel about 15 minutes upstream, you would get to Philadelphia. About 1.9 miles upstream is the Philadelphia Airport. Um, the star is exactly where the dock two would go that they want to build and export LNG from um, at this ter terminal called uh, Gibbstown Logistics Center. It says DuPont because it's an old contaminated DuPont site where for more than 100 years they manufactured explosives. So if you move downstream where you see that red line going, this is where the ships would go. And it goes right past Chester, which is an environmental justice community. It's um, a, a very dense uh, urban area. And it would then move downriver and across the Delaware Bay and out into the ocean. And then as you get down into uh, the area around uh, Puerto Rico, you'll see uh, Santa Domingo, on the left there, and then on the right you see San Juan. And of course that's San Juan, Puerto Rico. And that's where the ships that New Fortress Energy wants to send out from Gibbstown would end up. So on the next slide, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna give you a bigger view. So we're pulling back up and we're looking at where it says Philadelphia. That is Gibbstown, just like I said, a few minutes downstream from there. And the ships would travel across uh, to San Juan, Puerto Rico. Santa Domingo again is on the left there where that white dot is and San Juan, Puerto Rico where they want to build the import terminal um, is right there where that uh, white pointer is. So now we have a little, I love maps. It helps me orient what we're doing. So I hope that gives you a little picture of what we're going to be talking about. So now I'm going to turn it over to Jeff who's going to begin um, with the story of Puerto Rico and New Fortress Energy. Well, well, we have a, a lot in common uh, between New Jersey and Puerto Rico. People don't realize we're about the same size. We're about 125 miles uh, long. They're about that wide. Um, you know, we have, uh, uh, New Jersey has a densely populated urban areas followed by some beautiful countryside like the Pinelands and Highlands as does Puerto Rico with San Juan and going to La Yonca. Uh, but the, the other major thing we have in common is that we're also part of Region 2 EPA. So we have the same federal re, you know, regulations that, uh, over, and oversight from EPA in the two states. Uh, we also both have a lot of toxic waste sites and a lot of landfills, but we have a lot in common. More, more than two and a half million people in the Philadelphia and New York metropolitan area uh, come from uh, heritage in Puerto Rico. And, we have a state senator from Camden, Nilsa Cruz Perez, as an example. Uh, we also have something else we share in common, which is Chris Christie, who we were so glad was no longer governor of New Jersey, who ends up becoming a lobbyist for PURPA. Uh, but to talk about 
the, the big connection, which is that fracking in the Marsalis Shale in Pennsylvania will be shipping up to 1,600 trucks a day plus trains to Gibbstown, New Jersey, uh, going through densely ur populated urban areas, through highways, uh, right through the middle of cities, uh, rail lines that are built before World War I, and these bomb trains and bomb trucks will be coming through to get down to Gibbstown, where they will be offloading those uh, vehicles uh, into the tankers. And those tankers, there's no tank there. Those tankers will fill up with the natural gas uh, that's frozen down to minus 260 degrees. That's how they liquefy it. Um, and then, you know, ship it down to Puerto Rico and other places. Uh, for People don't realize it, that it's 600 times dense when they do it to get it that cold. So if there's a leak, um, it actually expands and can expand and impact places like Philadelphia, uh, South Jersey. Um, and the same thing would happen in San Juan, that you're putting these tankers into some of those densely populated areas. Even the Trump administration says that these facilities should be more than two miles from any type of population center. Yet we're putting them in the middle of one of the most densely populated regions in the United States, in both South Jersey and in Puerto Rico and in San Juan. And so this is a disaster waiting to happen. And that's why we're united together in fighting this, uh, because if there's a leak or an explosion, it, it could be cat catastrophic. The other point I wanted to make is that because it's so volatile, usually when they do these types of transshipment, they close the airport. And this is only three miles from Philadelphia Airport when the ships are, are in movement or when they close the bridges, which would be the Commodore Barry Bridge and the Delaware Memorial Bridge is that uh, it would be closed and many times they put National Guardsmen on top because it's so volatile. And then it will go off our coast all the way down to San Juan and again coming into a you know, densely populated area, um, creating you know, the potential for accidents or worse. And it's not needed. We, we, you know, neither New Jersey or Puerto Rico need natural gas. We need to be moving towards 100% renewable energy with offshore wind and uh, solar and energy efficiency. And it really is being designed to undercut it by the Trump administration because of their, their reliance on LNG and pushing for natural gas. And then I, you know, I wanted to mention Christie because it became very controversial that he's hired all these clients. He's been hired by all these clients and he's, as governor of New Jersey, he pulled us out of the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. He changed our energy master plan from renewable energy to promote gas. As we say about Chris Christie, when it comes to the environment, he's full of hot air. And unfortunately, his lobbying, I think, has been part of this because of his political connections. And so, you know, we've had our battles and we're battling here in New Jersey to try to stop them. And I'll talk more about a little, some of that later, but also the people in Puerto Rico are also standing up and fighting back. And we were not able to get FERC to take jurisdiction. We wanted to keep, you know, we wanted FERC, you know, but in Puerto Rico they have, and our battle continues. And I want to turn it over to Ruth now because I think her story is much more important than me keep talking. Um, so hi everyone, happy to be um, on this call connecting um, all the good things about uh, that, that New Jersey and Puerto Rico have in common. But unfortunately, we, we do need to talk about this very um, uh, difficult connection uh, or sort of problematic connection between um, New Jersey and Puerto Rico relating to the liquefied so-called natural gas um, and especially the new fortress energy, which is promoting so much of it. And so we can go to the next slide. Um, so uh, that uh, I think uh, most of you know that uh, the bottom line of the screen is that there is a glut of fracked gas, uh, uh, methane gas um, in the U.S. from fracking. And um, it's resulted, this is actually uh, 2019 information that I got out of the integrated resource plan from the Puerto Rico Electric Power Authority. Um, and so you can see that there are um, two terminals for export of all of that fracked gas that's coming out of the U.S. already, and four were under construction. Maybe some of them are in operation now. I'm sorry, I don't have the exact information. But the point is, so that's a huge um, industry, as we know, very powerful, 
and they are using all of their might and hiring people, as Jeff said, like Chris Christie, and to try to get a, a market, to create a market for that gas. And in that part of that market that they're really looking at closely is Puerto Rico, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit about that in, in, the, in the next slide. I want to make this this point right at the beginning, and one of the things where we see a great possibility for um, collaboration in our coalition, the We Want Sun, Queremos Sol Coalition, is that um, people in the states keep in mind that the after the hurricane damage here in Puerto Rico and after also earthquake damage here, especially to the electric system, um, the federal government allegedly, FEMA in particular, is going to provide huge amounts of federal funding, supposedly, to uh, rebuild um, the electric system here. And we, we need people in the states especially to be very um, aware and try to move the funding away from LNG projects, methane gas projects, towards the, some of the alternatives that we'll be discussing a little bit later. So in the next slide, um, we'll see, this is, uh, sorry for this, this is just too much information on one, one slide, um, but basically that just shows the, what we call the glut, right? Um, uh, at least as of 2019, there were 71.5 um, or 05 million tons of fracked gas um, in, in the U.S. And of that, basically 8 million tons were uncontracted capacity. That's what they want to bring to Puerto Rico, the Caribbean, and Central America, right? But they have a problem. Um, this industry has a problem. And one of them, especially as to Puerto Rico, is called the Jones Merchant Marine Act, which requires that shipment between U.S. ports San Juan being a U.S. port, that it be done in mostly U.S. flagged and manned and, and crewed ships or, or um, constructed uh, ships. And there are no real big LNG carriers um, made in the U.S. anymore. So th there's a huge problem. And what we're seeing is that there's a, also starting to uh, see a big loophole where these, these companies are putting um the lng the fracked gas um in iso containers they look like sort of huge bullets and um that's one way that that they're being able to uh, ship the the lng um be, even though they're not the, these bulk ships are not available um from the u.s um also uh they're doing what are called swaps, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, to sidestep the, the prohibition in the Jones Act um, from shipping this LNG in, in foreign ships. So in the next slide, um, we can see New Fortress Energy, which is, as I said, the, the, the company that's bringing um, gas uh, to the northern coast of Puerto Rico. There's already a plant, in, uh, two plants actually, in southern Puerto Rico. Um, so they went ahead and they built this LNG terminal in San Juan in a densely populated area. And it's supposed to supply, and it has been supplying for a few months now, part of the um, fuel for the San Juan power plant, two of the units there, which, are, which have been converted to, bur to burn this, this uh, methane gas. In the next slide, um, we, uh, are in a coalition, as I mentioned, called um, We Want San Queremos Son. And two of the organizations within the coalition, Cambio PR and AIFA, that you may have heard of AIFA, the Institute for Energy, Economics, and Financial Analysis, have been very helpful in our work um, to uh, transition our electric system to a more sustainable um, and um, uh, yeah, the clean energy system. Um, so they they looked into this um, new fortress contract and dealing and transaction uh, with the Puerto Rico Electric Power Authority and found that there were all kinds of irregularities in uh, this prior to even the request for proposals going out. New fortress had access to meetings and, and, and was um, getting information about PREPA 
that other companies did not have. And um, there, there's a strong possibility that there, there was um, illegalities or committed um, during this whole uh, pre-RFP process in order for New Fortress to get this contract with the, the Puerto Rico Electric Power Authority, which in the first five years alone amounts to $1.5 billion. So in the next slide, um, you'll see that we've come together in a broad-based alliance um, that includes faith-based groups and all of the organizations that are listed on that slide, in, on that slide which include, include community, like community, the, the groups that are closest to the communities that, that would be impacted um, by this LNG port if it gets going completely. And even now, as, for, as, it, as it operates sporadically, so as Puente, which has an office in New York, but also here in Puerto Rico, and, co and communities and, and environmental groups from throughout the island, and also the largest um, union of the Puerto Rico Electric Power Authority workers are part of our um, broad-based alliance in, in um, fighting this, this um, gas uh, flooding of, 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 of natural gas, so-called natural gas, to Puerto Rico. Let's go to the next slide. And so as Jeff mentioned, um, FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, in our situation, did issue an order to show cause against New Fortress. And um, with the indication that FERC seems to have jurisdiction, um, indicating that they would have jurisdiction, they have not yet determined definitely that, that FERC has jurisdiction. But um, they uh, seem to be inclined to, to, to do that, to make that determination. And so what we did um, in conjunction with other allies, including Earth Justice, um, the University of Puerto Rico Environmental Law Clinic and other attorneys, um, is we filed a protest and a motion to intervene in this order to show cause case um, because we, as I said, um, our, our allegation is that the new fortress terminal that it built is illegal. Um, so let's go to the next slide. And uh, primarily, our, our main argument is that there are many cumulative impacts to the environmental justice communities that are close to this LNG port terminal and also um, to the, the revaporization facilities. And that's, that's something a little bit different from the states where um, often the methane gas is used, is taken out of the wells and then directed into a pipeline many times straight to uh, the power plants and doesn't have to be liquefied. But here in Puerto Rico as an island, in order to be transported in these LNG carriers, it needs to be liquefied and then, and then um, later revaporized in order to be uh, burned. So that whole process creates a much more impacts to local communities. And I mentioned the numbers, the amounts of tens of thousands of people we have within a three mile range, there are 160, over 168,000 people. Um, and so as um, it, it's sort of in a similar situation to what uh, was uh, determined in the Standing Rock Sioux case recently, we're asking part of the, the what we're asking the uh, FERC is to vacate the, the um, any permits um, until uh, and, and, and shut down the pipeline, shut down the operation until um, New Fortress, if it can comply with NEPA. So next slide. Um, so that, that's sort of a, a map of a lot of the LNG projects. So this would be just the first and we're, we're of course trying to fight all the other projects that uh, some are more likely than others, but um, yeah, it, it's like a, an inundation, a flooding of with, with methane gas. So in the, in the next slide, um, we all know the public health risks and the health safety risks related to both regasifying and burning methane gas and the, the incredible increase, over 100% increase in volatile organic compounds in, in comparison to what is being burned here. And also, you know, the, 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 the risk of, it, of an explosion. Um, and so basically we're um, requiring um, New Fortress to do the safety and environmental review required by, by NEPA. 
the Nas National uh, Environmental Policy Act. Next slide. Um, so as we mentioned, uh, New Fortress is, um, it, it's a tent, it's like a, a, a tentacles. It has different tentacles in, in, in different types of corporations, different names. It's all um, sort of in, in the US, but also especially trying to get into Central America to, to here to the Caribbean. Um, especially in Jamaica, they, they want to do this sort of um, uh, what they call transshipment hub, and they're doing these swaps apparently. And the swaps are, even if the Jones Act does not allow them to bring the gas directly from the U.S. to Puerto Rico, they, they are, um, have at least attempted and on, on maybe one or more occasions actually shipped gas to Jamaica and possibly brought that to Puerto Rico in violation of the Jones Act. So the next, in the next slide, it's, it, what we see is total disregard for the rule of law on the part of New Fortress. They do not have an authorization from FERC the, or, or from the Federal Department of Transportation and the Pipeline Hazardous um, and Management uh, uh, Safety Administration, the Hazardous Material Safety Administration or the Puerto Rico Department of Transportation. Um, and they're planning to build another pipeline is, is what they're telling their investors. In the next slide, um, as I mentioned, we have these Jones Act violations and that's, that's um, one of our um, strongest arguments uh, in, in the case. Um, in the next slide, let's see, we know about the fire risks because um, this is something that's been studied by the Sandia National Labs and also by the um, Lawrence Livermore National Labs that um, LNG uh, fires are, are not, don't necessarily um, de develop in an anticipated way. The, the, sometimes the, the vapor clouds are, are larger than expected. The chemistry is very complicated and it's not, it's, even more complicated than a hydrocarbon fuel fire. So in the next slide, um, one of the arguments that um, is being used, as, as Jeff mentioned, so the, that natural gas, that methane gas is a, is a bridge fuel and that we need to do that before we go to renewables. Well, that's the total fallacy. And already Puerto Rico is burning more of this methane gas. That's the majority of the uh, power generation, 43% already um, comes from the natural gas. And um, so we don't need to do any more diversification, so-called diversification with methane gas. We can go to, look at how low, I mean, here in a Caribbean island, the, the renewables are two to 3% um, of the energy mix. And so in the next slide, um, incredibly, this, plant that's being supplied by New Fortress by this LNG and, and the gas from New Fortress is actually the most expensive baseload plant in Puerto Rico um, burning this gas. And um, uh, Earth Justice did a great job in finding that, that information. Um, and so that defeats the economic argument as well. Um, and in the next slide, um, so what we see is that Earth, uh, uh, sorry, uh, New Fortress um, has not only in Puerto Rico, but in other places as well, are in, in Gibbstown apparently, come in to say that they're going to do one project and submit a documentation for, let's say, a simpler project or more uh, a, a appealing kind of project and then do a very... Um, sort of uh, misleading and uh, um, different and, and more a, a project with many more impacts um, to both the public health and safety and also to uh, the environment. And that's what we saw with New Fortress talking about um, initially doing a, a microfuel handling facility, truck handling facility, um, and now they're actually supplying a whole power plant and two big units. Uh, for many megawatts, uh, 400 megawatts of energy generation with their gas. So in the next slide, this is uh, basically 
what we're seeking from FERC uh, is um, many things, uh, not just um, that FERC is, allow us to intervene in the case, but also that um, FERC require, as we mentioned, an environmental impact statement so we can see the full implications to public health and safety and um, to the environment and um, to seek an, an injunction against New Fortress. Um, we're asking FERC to consider ordering New Fortress to disgorge the profits that they've generated thus far. And I thought this was the best remedy. Um, someone found in, in Earth Justice actually found um, a provision in the Natural Gas Act or in, in, in the FERC regulations as well that would allow new, um, FERC to order new fortress to pay penalties of a million dollars per year per, per day for each day of Ill, of the illegal construction which at this point would be over 500 million dollars and that that could be used to fund renewables and energy storage projects and um, energy efficiency and conservation demand response all of the alternatives to centralize fossil fuel long distance transmission energy um, that is so makes us so vulnerable in Puerto Rico, um, especially during hurricanes and other natural events. So I think I'll leave it there and um, happy to take questions later on. Thank you. Sorry, I, have to, I had to unmute myself. It's uh, Jeff Tittle again. I just wanted to give a bit of a rundown of what's happening because there's a lot of battles going on against New Fortress and their chairman, Wes Edens. And I just want to mention him because he's a very powerfully connected person, uh, very active in, in politics throughout the country and is the owner of the Milwaukee Bucks. So, you know, for those from Philadelphia, a root for the Sixers over the Bucks, you've got another good reason to do it. But people up in Wyalusing, Pennsylvania have been organized and have been fighting um, against their um, station up there to turn the natural gas into liquefaction and also been fighting against a pipeline to bring it there. And um, it's critical because right now the battle is, seems to be working that the plant is at least now on hold and so is the, um, the, the pipeline. Um, here in New Jersey, we have a very big battle going on and you know, in, we're part of a coalition, the Sierra Club is in Delaware Riverkeeper with Empower New Jersey, which is over 110 environmental, labor, social justice, uh, and faith-based organizations um, that have been fighting for a moratorium on fossil fuel infrastructure and power plants in New Jersey. And we're trying to put pressure on our governor uh, because DEP has given out some of the permits and not all of them, but there's a couple of big ones still out there and he seems to be very uh, much aloof or looking the other way uh, on this, as well as he's on the Delaware River Basin Commission. And um, there's, a, there's a series of um, actions against the Delaware River Basin Commission. They, uh, Delaware Riverkeeper has uh, sued and taken it to an administrative law judge, and it's coming back to the commission to, dis to determine what's going to happen with their DRBC permits, where what, where what happened was the DRBC within just a few days of a meeting, gave out a special meeting notice. They rushed the approvals through. Um, they didn't even, in their approvals, didn't even mention it was an LNG terminal. Um, and then ended up reopening the public process. And and basically it was a charade. It's the same kind of games that uh, Wes Eden's played in New Fortress down in Puerto Rico and New Jersey and in the, in the, and in the, in the Delaware River Basin area. And the DRBC approved it. And so now we're trying to develop a campaign to, um, to, to, to basically get our governor and the other governors in the region to, to, uh, to deny those permits that were, we believe, wrongfully granted without enough public participation. And that's also true in New Jersey uh, on the permits that are granted. Um, but New Fortress is all over. I mean, they're in Miami, they have a train there, and they're, gonna, they're as you know, uh, Ruth said, they're transshipping out of there and uh, already. Um, you know, they're all over the world. I mean, not only are they there, they're in Jamaica, they're in, they're, they've applied in Angola, they haven't been approved. Uh, unfortunately, in Mexico, they just got approval for their liquefaction plant there, uh, and they're, they're building a port down in Nicaragua. And in Ireland, which we'll, Tracy will talk about later, will be a subject of another webinar. 
Um, there's a lot of opposition to bringing in LNG uh, imports. And so that's another big battle going on. On another positive piece of news, the company that was supposed to supply most of the natural gas to the Wyalusing gas of liquefaction uh, uh, plant, Chesapeake went out of business and we see the price of natural gas dropping. We see states like New Jersey and New York moving forward with offshore wind at a, at a very high pace. And so hopefully um, we can keep enough pressure on to turn down these permits, but more importantly, we need to move quickly to 100% renewable. And uh, I'll stop there, thank you. Okay. So now that we've heard, um, first of all, thank you, Tracy and Jeff and everyone that's here. Um, so what we've heard now are kind of the things that are not as positive of all the situation. And in my experience, environmentalists have always been told that we are the groups that just say no to things. And that's not the reality. We do have a lot of proposals uh, that are convenient for not only the health of our communities, uh, but for the environment and for the economy. Um, so this first slide is from one of the biggest fights that we had in Puerto Rico against gas. And it's to represent that, you know, like in the US, there was the Keystone XL pipeline. We've been fighting gas for a lot of time now. And the communities and the people in Puerto Rico are clear that that's not the solution that we want for our communities because it's not, you know, everything that we talked about. So that uh, picture is from one of the biggest marches that we had a few years ago against Villa Verde, which was a big gas pipeline that they were trying to build in Puerto Rico. Um, next slide. Uh, so because we saw that all these things were happening in Puerto Rico with fossil fuels, we wanted to make sure um, that from the community and environmental groups, we had a concrete and you know, uh, proposal that exemplified the reality that we wanted to see in the island regarding energy. So we sat down with a broad coalition, uh, part of the groups that Ruth mentioned before, uh, and we sat down for a few months to write down what is Queremos Sol which is a about 30 page proposal that has ideas on how we want to move forward on clean energy in Puerto Rico, while we make sure that we do not construct any new fossil fuel and that we move away and close down all the fossil fuel industries in the island. So next slide. So at the bottom, you see some of the logos of the organizations that are part of Queremos Sol. And we set out a goal of having 100% clean energy in Puerto Rico by 2050, you know? And not only that, but also make sure that any transformation that happens in PREPA, which is the power authority in Puerto Rico, and it's a public entity um, still uh, remains a public entity because we, all the groups made an understanding that energy is not only you know a commodity that uh, is used around the world and in our communities but it's also a human you know necessity it is a human right to be able to access energy and when we lived here at maria a few years ago we saw that people literally died because of not having power in their communities right so we under that big umbrella we outline what are um, about 10 steps. I'm not going to go over all of them, but over some of what we see is the path that needs to happen to make sure that we move away from these fossil fuels. So next slide. So first is efficiency. In Puerto Rico, we have a big issue specifically with losing uh, electricity because of transmission lines, because of lack of proper appliances in people's homes. They either not have, you know, the best uh, air conditioners or the best uh, refrigerators. So one of the things that we started to outline is that we need efficiency programs in Puerto Rico 
that not only educate people, but also bring incentives. So in the proposal, we talked about uh, incentivizing people to buy solar water heaters, to buy smarter appliances and create incentives by the government so that people can do that. Because we do have an understanding that not everyone has the capacity to go out and buy a new refrigerator. It needs to come as an incentive so that we can then start not only, you know, uh, reducing the amount of energy we use, but use it in a smarter way. So other things that we talked about that is making sure that people have access to things such as energy audits. Not everyone knows about those and creating access for people to understand how they're using the energy in their homes. And in the proposal, we added a few different ideas that we gathered from other places. And one of them that I always think that is very interesting is a paying before you use uh, kind of approach. Here in Puerto Rico, a lot of people um, just have the relationship with the power authority by just receiving a bill at the end of the month and saying, oh my gosh, I spent $200 on energy. What do I do now? So maybe creating programs for people just like you do with your cell phone, prepay an amount of energy. And when you're reaching the peak, you'll receive a message and you'll decide, well, I can either use my energy smarter or I can pay more. So creating again incentives for people to be more efficient with their energy, conserve uh, and build those incentives for everyone. Next slide. So the second point is that we want renewable distributed generation. And this is something, you know, that um, in New Jersey would be in another place that we can talk about that is since Puerto Rico is just 100 by 35 miles, like we mentioned, if we build long scale solar farms, we would be tapping into our local resources for land use, for conservation and for food security. So because we don't want to use those resources to just put a lot of you know, solar farms, we have started to look for distributed solar energy on the rooftops of houses as a solution of creating what we would see as mini grids in the community where people that have the capacity can have panels in their homes, they can have storage so that they can, you know, uh, build these batteries with energy based on those solar panels. And that these communities that have this solar distributed generation systems can feed energy to others that might not have that capacity, you know, uh, we understand that not everyone either can afford or has uh, the infrastructure in the house to have solar panels. So how can we create a system where the community is installing solar panels at the top of their homes, storing that energy and also supplying to other folks? And, you know, it's interesting because here we, in Puerto Rico, we also talked about the idea of using what we call brownfield. So making sure that it's spaces that have no use for agriculture, no use for anything such as parkings or closed down landfills to also put those solar farms. And it's, it's been a, an interesting conversation in the terms of energy because sometimes when we talk about energy in the grand scale, um, people tend to think that we just want to build big solar farms. And again, we see that the solution in Puerto Rico needs to be more focused on the idea that we're an island and that people have the capacity to have solar panels on the top of their homes and create electricity for other folks. And we're not saying that this out of a vacuum, we're working with professors from the University of Mayagüez, which is the technical public university on Puerto Rico. And they created um, a study where they identified the amount of solar panels needed to do this idea. And they proved in the study that's possible to have renewable distributed generation in the top of our homes and supply to other homes that do not have energy, right? Um, next slide. The third thing that we see is that we need to phase out of fossil fuels. In Puerto Rico, we use coal, we use gas, and we use oil, and we have so much sun. And we want to make sure that, as mentioned, there is no new infrastructures in Puerto Rico. So that's uh, one of the focuses that we're doing in 
for New Fortress is because this is one of the newest uh, fossil fuels infrastructure that we're seeing built. So we want to make sure that there's nothing new and that we're phasing out our coal plant, our gas infrastructure, and our oil. And we want to make sure that uh, we do not create a false sense of security by having these things. Uh, in Puerto Rico, as you know, we have hurricanes, we've had earthquakes. So sometimes in the media, there is this narrative where they say that if we don't have the fossil fuels, we won't have reliable energy. So, and that's not the truth. We can create reliable energy with the sun. We've seen throughout the years that solar energy has advanced even more than we expected. It's now more accessible. There's smarter um, solar panels and battery systems that we can be so that we make sure that we're facing out the fossil fuels and just bringing in new energy. And like Ruth mentioned before, there is this idea that they use here that you can bring gas as like a transition fuel, which is not the reality because you're building infrastructure, you're burning something and you are uh, literally affecting other people because of using this. So we wanna make sure that we are eliminating all the fossil fuels that we have on the island. Next slide. So the fourth step to achieving the 100% energy goal by 2050 is the new model of public governance. And as mentioned before, we have a public entity that is the PREPA energy. And we wanna make sure that it's a public entity. We don't want it privatized because like we mentioned before, we see energy as a public need. But we need to make sure that the model that they've been using, which is basically a business model to produce um, you know, capital for specific people is not the model that they're using. So we want to transition that model and focus uh, a public entity that's more focused on managing demand, on managing efficiency, and focusing on transitioning out those fossil fuels. Uh, right now, there's a lot of uh, conversations here in Puerto Rico because a contract is being set out to a company called Luma Energy. And they're basically selling a prepa to this company. And the reality of the situation, and we can go on for hours talking about how bad prepa has been managed over the years, how it's a bankrupt corporation, how it hasn't done good on maintenance. There can be many things said, but in our coalition, we realize that we want to keep this public model, but change some of the governance structures that has been happening over the years. Um, and we've been tied to a lot of contracts throughout the year. So energy in Puerto Rico uh, is sometimes even a fixed price because of those contracts. So we want to make sure that there's no more contracts that tie us to either fossil fuels or coal. One of the greatest examples of those contracts is the AES coal plant in the south of Puerto Rico, where even if they're not producing energy, there's a cost that is transmitted to the people of the island. So again, we need a new public model of governance for all of this energy to work because we don't want to be bringing in solar and still have this capitalist model of a business that's not providing the services that people need. Next slide. Number four, number five is citizen participation. And this is something that we are doing right now. So this is great. We want citizens to not just be uh, users of energy without understanding their energy. We don't want people to just be clients and turn on a switch and pay a bill and not understand or even be able to take part in the decisions being made on their energy systems. So we have been working, you know, to make sure that there is education on where our energy is coming from, may, educating people on those fossil fuels that we're burning right now bringing up the impact that they're creating in other communities. For example, the coal that we're burning in Puerto Rico is from Colombia and it's impacting communities there. Also in the terms of governance, we wanna make sure that people are, well, we say in Spanish, prosumidores. They are not just consumers, but they can also produce energy in their house, like we mentioned with solar panels. And this is something that, again, will take some time for people um, to be able to do, but we think it's totally necessary if we really want to see a change on the system. Next slide. Number six uh, is labor participation. 
like Ruth mentioned, we have the UTIER as part of our coalition, and they are the linemen and the people that actually understand all of the things that are happening. I'm not an engineer, I'm a geographer, so I don't know how to plug any of those things. And these folks who are actually doing the work on the street want the PREPA company to transition to solar energy. And it's incredible because they have a huge amount of, of workforce. There are a lot of people in there. And we want to make sure that anything that happens is including these people that are trained, that are professionals, and that want to see the change in Puerto Rico to solar energy. So any change that happens anywhere, we want to include the labor, we want to make them participants, and we want to not, you know, just, we have an understanding that there's people that will be working in either the coal plant or the gas infrastructures. So we want to have a conversation with them on how we can transition their work into new energies, you know? Um, so that's something that we are really passionate about. And part of the public model of all this is creating those jobs that are unionized, that are well paid, that have hopefully retirement plans and other benefits to the, to the people that are literally risking their lives during hurricanes, during earthquakes to bring us the power that we need. Next slide. So like mentioned, we created this proposal, um, which is focused on public policy on the issue of energy in Puerto Rico. Uh, they, about a year or two ago, there was the law 17 being created in Puerto Rico to create a public policy on energy. And this is what we presented there. And we've been talking to people about this issue since then and making sure that even if the law doesn't include everything that we wanted to see. The work that we're doing will move Puerto Rico to the 100% clean energy by 2050. And next slide. And you know, I wanted to finish up with this picture because for for a lot of people in Puerto Rico, Hurricane Maria was a wake up call for many things. And I had the experience with a lot of volunteers and folks from El Puente and a lot of our coalition partners to hand out solar lanterns. And it was incredible to see how people reacted to solar energy because a lot of them had never even hold in their hands a solar panel. They had no idea how it worked. So for me, it was a very eye-opening experience to be able to give people a lamp like the one that we see in the picture, explain to them that it has a battery, you connect the solar panel, it charges the battery, and how it works and one of my you know most eye-opening experiences was we we gave the lamp to a person in a community and he seemed very skeptical he looked at us like we were crazy people telling him that this was gonna you know fill a battery by putting this panel into the sun and we gave it to him we gave him the training and we went uh, a week after and this person almost with tears in their eyes was just so amazed by the solar power and the solar energy and I think, you know, that's one of the things that we've learned throughout this process. People need to see it with their own eyes and it's very eye-opening when they realize that we don't need to be burning fossil fuels. We can use the sun and we can light up our, our homes, you know? So next slide. Um, that last slide is the link to our Queremos Sol proposal. Um, you can look it up. It's in English and in Spanish and you can see all the details that we have included there. So thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adriana. Thank you, Ruth. And thank you, Jeff. Uh, excellent presentations and a, a really compelling story. So at this time, I'd like to pick up some of the questions that have been asked in the Q&A. Um, so whoever thinks they can answer this, uh, First one, uh, is the Aguari gas port back on the table? Okay, um, so thank you for that question. And um, they're referring to, um, it was actually on the, the map that I showed with all of the gas projects because officially it is still, it's a gas port in South, here in Southern Puerto Rico in, in Salinas. And officially, it's still in the PREPA integrated resource plan prepared by Siemens industry. But it's not a likely option. It's, it's pretty much 
not even uh, realistic because um, the, the permits were withdrawn. It was something we worked on for a number of years and were able to basically defeat. And um, so it, it's, it's not likely that they would start the permitting process again or try to, to build that project. Um, but it was quite a struggle, um, yeah, to get that. Well, congratulations on defeating that. Adriana, did you want to add anything or? Uh, no, Ruth summarized it perfectly. <laughs> okay, great. Um, our next question is, it looks like uh, New Fortress Energy is trying to make Puerto Rico into a distribution hub for frac gas. Is that a possibility or do you think that really could happen? Oh yeah, absolutely. So Puerto Rico is the, in, in the Caribbean and Central America, Puerto Rico has the second largest electric system. Um, so there's been lots of development and well, yeah. Uh, so there's been that kind of development, let's say. And um, so there, there, uh, there's always been talk about making Puerto Rico the hub for energy to other Caribbean islands, especially. Uh, and certainly, uh, New Fortress has talked about other kinds of projects throughout the island and, um, and bringing in so much gas that it would really exceed what e e even the local needs here. So it's, that's a possibility. Right. Yeah. And, you know, that's another um, parallel with the Delaware River Basin because we're very concerned because of the large uh, freshwater ports and the access to the ocean from the deepened channel that the industry is trying to turn our region into a hub, basically exactly. a frac gas hub. And we've been fighting that concept for many years and this LNG is the newest manifestation of the industry's push to do that. We're not gonna let it happen though, right? That's right. <laughs> None of us will. Um, so. Another question um, is, who will pay for the building of any of these LNG facilities? Is it all private money? Is there public money? Who pays? All right, well, um, so I don't know how many people know that Puerto Rico rate payers, people in Puerto Rico who um, uh, are clients of PREPA, right, um, pay the second highest electric rates of any U.S. jurisdiction. Right, so Hawaii has the first, Puerto Rico the second. I think that Alaska is right in there too. Um, so ultimately, the Puerto Rico people of Puerto Rico will pay. We're paying right now. Well, with the COVID um, sort of uh, dislocation of markets and things, we're I think we're down to about 17 cents. But just before we were at like 21 cents per kilowatt hour. So that's what ultimately that's how it gets paid now. The initial financing is different in, uh, um, under different situations when um, a lot of the plants like the, um, the for example, the, the one in Southern Puerto Rico, the so-called Costa Sur plant, that was financed with public uh, bond issues, right? Puerto Rico is now, as we know, in uh, a sort of bankruptcy uh, situation under a particular law called PROMESA. And um, so Puerto Rico can't issue bonds right now, right? So can't incur debt. And, and so what they're doing are with these so-called public-private partnerships. And with New Fortress, um, what we saw is a new, new Fortress actually doing, going out into getting the financing, but and then charging the, as, as such high rates that there's no savings involved in spite of the fact that the, the methane gas is cheaper um, than other things that we're burning, like the oil, for example, islands burn oil. There are lots of things about electric systems that, that are quite different from continents in, in islands. So, um, the, the, so what we're seeing is that New Fortress is passing on these huge costs to Puerto Rico, um, although they're, it, they're doing the initial investment. I, I would just add we all pay because from the people who live in the Marsalis Shale who see their forests cut down and their water polluted to the people who live along the bomb trains and truck routes to the people in South Jersey who 
people have this facility in their backyard that's so dangerous to the people along um, the Delaware River when the ships go in and out all the way to Puerto Rico and all the people there who are also put in harm's way, whether it's from safety or health or climate impacts. Uh, after all, you know, we're seeing the worst climate impacts in New Jersey of almost any state in the union and more natural gas and more fossil fuels will make us healthier and cause a lot more damage to all of us. Yeah. And I wanted to add, so after, again, after the hurricanes, we've seen a lot of influx of like FEMA, uh, HUD, and a lot of federal funds to do like relief and disaster recovery work. And sadly, some of the companies are looking for those funds to use it to, to build these fossil fuel industries. Right. And, you know, that we see this in, in here in the United States, too, with subsidies such as tax breaks. The Pennsylvania legislature just gave away a huge amount of money in order to spur shale gas development uh, by building fertilizer plants. And some of the money might even go for uh, processing other sorts of processing. Um, and so the public is actually paying to poison themselves um, because of the incredibly destructive human health and environmental impacts of fracking. Um, so yes, and, and we see the same thing at Gibbstown. The terminal, yes, it's being uh, you know, uh, financed by a hedge fund manager, Wes Edens, uh, who owns and you know, co-chairs New Fortress Energy, um, along with Mr. Lasky, but um, the county government there is building the access road to get into the facility with public tax money. So it's the same game being played. Use as much as you can um, in order to avoid paying real costs, avoid uh, regulation, avoid jurisdiction of agencies, and cut costs and externalize as much as you can. So I have a couple other little questions here, and we we're past eight o'clock, but if people want to hang on, they're really good questions. So uh, is it okay with you, Ruth and Adriana and Jeff? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So. How has the local government with Cuermo's sole proposal uh, been involved, if at all? Yeah, well, actually, um, the, we um, started working on Queremos Sol about, just about two years ago. And um, I, I, there was a whole history of, of, of um, civil society groups working on proposals for alternatives for the electric system. Um, and Unfortunately, when the legislature in about August or September of, of 2018, after we started meeting, when they um, submitted the bill, which became the energy public policy law, um, they, they did adopt some of the things that we had, like the 2050 100% goal and, and then some of the intermediate goals, but they incorporated a provision about you know, the old transition argument, right, of the doing the transition with the methane gas, with the LNG, uh, the, the so-called natural gas. And um, so they, the government is married to that. They want to do a trans, they pay lots of lip service to the 100% the renewable energy goal and the energy efficiency and the, all of the alternatives that we're proposing, but they want to do gas first and that's and the, that's what they're doing and it's terrible and we can't we need people's help in the states to keep the federal funding from FEMA or whatever agency from going to LNG infrastructure methane gas plants um, and long distance transmission especially from here from southern Puerto Rico to the north um, so, yeah, uh, basically the government has been, everyone wants to hear, especially here, about renewable energy alternatives and efficiency and all these other things, but they're not, they're, the, the government is not moving in that direction. They're moving in the opposite direction, actually, unfortunately. Adriana, did you have anything to add to that? Well, I'll just add, you know, like Ruth mentioned, we were able to add some some things like the goal into the public policy, but definitely it did not translate into the, like, the reality of, of the public policy. We have had, you know, we've been using Queremos Sol as an outreach and public policy for about two years, like Ruth mentioned, and in the media and with local communities, it has 
had a lot of resonance. So we've been able at least um, create a stance in the public opinion for clean energy and put at least like a, like a, again, a consistent message on clean energy. I think before uh, there was many different um, ideas rolling around and we as a coalition have done a good job of being a front to anything that the government proposes like the new fortress and using Keremosol as a, as a proposal. And, and it has taken a great um, taking on, on the media and, and the public. So we have a question and uh, maybe Jeff or Adriana or Ruth might know this, but how uh, would the force of the explosion in Beirut compare to a large LNG release that reaches an ignition source or causes a blevy. Um, well, I would just say it that what happened in Beirut um, would be like popping a balloon next to uh, a, an LNG tanker. Or, you know, I mean, the blast from a truck along is more than a thousand feet and could reach 2,000 feet. Uh, when you think about one of these facilities in Puerto Rico, um, the blast areas are quite large. I mean, that's why I said earlier that the Trump administration says they should, that the, these ports should be two miles away from the, the nearest populations because, it, you know, what happens is there's a leak um, and it expands dramatically almost 600 times. It's super cold and it freezes things along the way and you can get into low spots. It can travel quite far, especially when you're next to a river where it could actually seep along the cold water in the river and move up towards Philadelphia. But when it ignites, it's really closer to an atomic bomb going off if there's a large volume of gas um, or napalm than it is to um, something like what, what happened in Beirut. I mean, what Beirut was a tragedy. Um, if that was an LNG port um, terminal, half of Beirut probably would be gone. I mean, a small explosion back in the late 40s in Cleveland destroyed 40 blocks, and that was a tiny explosion. Anything anybody else wants to add? Um, I'll just invite people to search. I mean, uh, we've done the search like on Google, on YouTube and there's some very uh, devastating and, and sadly impressive videos of LNG explosions. So um, people want to know how can they support the work that Ruth and Adriana are doing? Um, what can they do to help out? Um, is it funding? Um, is it support and over here in the United States? Do you have any suggestions of what people can do to help you out in your efforts? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so we, uh, we need people uh, to contact um, their government officials, um, both in Congress and in the federal government, and let them know that no federal funding should go for LNG or methane gas projects um, or um, transmission systems that go from south to north, uh, long distance, high voltage. Um, because we are talking about uh, the, all of the alternatives to that. And um, so we can, uh, if people want to contact us, uh, feel free to give out my email or Adriana, I'm sure. Um, and we'd be happy to talk about more specific ways to help us get the word out to, in, in, in the U.S. public opinion. Um, I want to do a shout out to Ilda, um, <laughs> uh, who is on, uh, Ilda um, is on the, I, I see that it's on the call here, and, and uh, she's been a, a great ally. Ilda Jorenz, thank you. Okay, yeah. did you want to add anything, Adriana? I sent on the chat two links. One of them is a petition that we created, um, it's in Spanish, but you can probably, it translates uh, when you go in it. Uh, so if it, people can go in and sign the petition, it's against the privatization of the public uh, 
electric company here. The second link is the Queremos Sol link because I saw a person asking for it. So that second link, you can also in the Queremos Sol page sign on uh, to the Queremos Sol and that also supports us to make sure that we have a lot of people um, supporting it. Great, thank you. And we also have a question from folks about how they can support our struggle against the Gibbstown export terminal. So um, I'm gonna ask Peter, who's on the call, to put the links to the petition and the municipal campaign. Right now we have going a very active campaign to influence the commissioners at the Delaware River Basin Commission, who will be considering in the coming weeks, perhaps in September, about whether or not they are going to allow this project to move ahead. They have sort of the penultimate uh, vote on this. There are other agencies that have critical vote, critical uh, uh, permits as well, like the Army Corps of Engineers and New Jersey DEP, but they can't move ahead without the DRBC. And we're speaking directly as the public to those commissioners who are the governors of the four states that have parts that flow to the Delaware River watershed. So that's Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware, and New York. And since they do have um, constituents and we are all um, looking to them as elected officials who are acting in our best interest to protect the entire watershed um, and the, the four states and respect clean air and water, we do expect that those commissioners are gonna respond. So we have a petition campaign. We're looking for many, many signatures on that. Peter's gonna put that link in there. Also, we have um, it on the Delaware Riverkeeper Network site and the Empower New Jersey site that Jeff mentioned earlier. We also have a very active municipal resolution campaign. We're attempting to get resolutions passed all along the transportation route through Pennsylvania and New Jersey, where this dangerous LNG will be coursing through and people who live in these communities don't even know that they could be right next to a bomb train um, or a bomb uh, truck um, that has an accident or derailment and their, their lives are uh, indelibly changed. So we, um, that resolution campaign, there's a link that where you can get connected with that and on Delaware Riverkeeper Network's webpage, you just put Gibbstown LNG terminal in the search and you'll find a whole year's worth of information that our coalition has been working together against the terminal. So please uh, do connect after, um, uh, this is done. We will be sharing with everybody who registered for the webinar tonight the link to the recording so you can share it and then other links as well to ways that you can get involved to stop the Gibbstown as well as the Puerto Rican uh, connection as Ruth called it the unfortunate connection that New Fortress Energy has made. Now we're making a people-to-people -people positive connection. Exactly. We're gonna beat them, and that's how we're going to beat them. That's right. So I also would just like to say um, thank you. Uh, thank you to all of our panelists tonight, and thank you to the public who attended. Um, it has been really great to have a lot of people participating. And I want to let you know that our next webinar is going to be on Thursday, August 27th at 2 p.m. And we have a special guest, Johnny McGilligan. He's from um, uh, Safety Before LNG. And He's the leader of the grassroots organization that has been fighting the import terminal for LNG in Shannon, Ireland, that New Fortress Energy wants to build there in order to get the Gibbstown gas um, to them. So uh, again, another connection. Um, it's all one big project. We have to look at it that way, cradle to grave, because we're going to feel the impacts cradle to grave. So thank you all for, um, for chiming in. Um, Thank you for your wonderful presentations. Ruth, Adriana, and Jeff, we're honored to have had you as our special guest tonight. And thank you to everybody who joined us. And please, get engaged. We all need you. But thank you, and good night. Thank you, thank you to everyone also. Thanks. Bye-bye.